After conducting highly successful counter-offensive operations in Kherson and Kharkiv blasts, the Ukrainian advance has stalled since late 2022. For weeks, we've been hearing about an imminent major Russian offensive in Ukraine, possibly on several axes, at a time when Russia is already advancing around Bakhmut in Donbass. In December 2022, the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, General Valery Zaluzhny, claimed that a Russian general offensive would start between January and March, noting Donbass, South Ukraine and Kyiv as possible fighting areas. In early February, the Ukrainian defense minister, Alexei Reznikov, speculated that the Russian offensive might start before February 24th, the anniversary of the Russian invasion. On February 6th, an unnamed advisor of the Ukrainian army told Financial Times that the Russian army would launch its offensive within the next 10 days. Signals from the Russian leadership and expectations of Russian military bloggers also point to an imminent offensive operation by Russia. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has stated that Russia has more than 200,000 soldiers in Ukraine and is actively stockpiling weapons. The Ukrainian military expert Roman Svitan has claimed that an additional 100,000 Russians will be sent to Ukraine within February, increasing their numbers to 400,000 men, half of whom are in Donbass. It is clear that Russia is planning something significant to claim a victory in Ukraine. But what would that something significant look like? The Russian military blogger Ian Matviv has shared his view on where and how the Russians may intend to attack and we're going to discuss that in this video. If the chaos of these events makes you glad your own existence is safer, then remember that these days you are closer to losing control of your assets than you think. Connect to the wrong Wi-Fi network, click the wrong link, or visit the wrong website, and hostile agents will begin to record your passwords, bank details, and anything else they can use to take what you have. Most people know this is a risk on the internet, but maybe you don't know how easy it is to secure yourself against it. Use our sponsor NordVPN at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. NordVPN encrypts and reroutes your data through servers of your choice, which makes your information useless to the so-called men in the middle looking to steal it. This is especially important when you're accessing the internet in public places or if you fall victim to a fake link. You can also use NordVPN to access region-locked content, and their threat protection system fights viruses and malware too. Take advantage of our special deal. Get an extra gift when you sign up for a two-year plan by using our link, nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. They offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can try it all out risk-free. Secure yourself now at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. First, Matviev rejected a claim that Russia may make another attempt on Kyiv. He argues that the Russian army would need 1-2 to two million soldiers to be deployed in Belarus and Ukraine to conduct such an operation. At this point, Russia reportedly has 5-10,000 to 10, men and very few tanks and artillery in Belarus, which would be a logical staging point for an attack on Kyiv. So we can assume that Kyiv is not a target at this point. He also downplayed a possibility of an attack on Kharkiv, as it would require at least one new tank division and one new motor rifle division to have a chance. Politically speaking, it may be a tempting target, so at some point Putin may give it a chance, but it looks unlikely. American military analyst Michael Kaufman agrees with this conclusion, as he does not believe that Russia will attempt to open another front by attacking Kyiv, Kharkiv or Sumy. Ian Matviev believes that the focus of Russian attacks will be mainly on Donetsk and Luhansk blasts, but there will also be several supportive actions on other axes. He expects Bakhmut to continue being the central axis of the Russian attack, with Slovyansk and Kramatorsk being the end goal of this attack. But an attack on a single axis would not be sufficient to achieve a breakthrough, as it would enable the Ukrainian defenders to focus on that particular section and negate any manpower and firepower advantage that the Russians have in this area. Therefore, Russia will likely conduct offensives on secondary axes too. As of February 10th, this is already happening in the Crimea section. According to Matviev, the ongoing attacks on Volodar and in Mariinka, along with a potential offensive on Orkiv sections, may be feints to distract the Ukrainians. Having said that, Matviev rightly argues that even though these attacks may be secondary initially, 
the Russian command may focus on them more if they prove to be successful and promising. But as the Wagner mercenaries and the Russian army are already progressing around Bakhmut, the Russian command will probably focus there. The end goal of this offensive is the capture of Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. Let's look at a deeper dive of Matviev on the Russian tactics on this axis. The expert expects the Russian army to continue using its most successful offensive tactic to date, attacking along a wide front with assault groups to achieve small breakthroughs, switching from storming Ukrainian positions to flank attacks on key settlements. If successful, Russia seeks to straighten out the front line and prepare for an attack on the next line of defense. The critical feature here is that the depth of the attack is usually not more than 10 kilometers. First, because almost every small town and village on this front is a stronghold, achieving decisive breakthroughs is very costly and takes a lot of time. Second, Russia wants to stay within the range of its short-range howitzers and MLRS, allowing the ground units and artillery units to communicate regularly and act in coordination. This is an important factor since Russia has suffered from a lack of communication between different branches of its army since the start of the war. Being close to the front lines makes it easier for Russian artillerists to use their drones to spot Ukrainian positions. At this point, the Russian army is fighting to advance on Chasivya and secure it, which would allow them to cut the last remaining supply line to Bakhmut. Presumably, the Ukrainian army would then be in an operational encirclement and decide to leave Bakhmut to their next line of defense, while Russia would advance on Konstantinovka to straighten their lines enabling their artillery to move forward and threaten their next target. According to Matviev, this will be Seversk. Presumably, they will attempt to move on Seversk from the south, from Solodar, from the east, from Lysychansk, and from the northeast, from Bilaharivka. Matviev says that if Bakhmut falls, the Ukrainian units defending Seversk would be in danger of envelopment, forcing them to withdraw from the town. We must remind you here that Matviev is describing the best-case scenario for Russia. At the time of writing this script on February 13th, the only notable advance towards Seversk was achieved from the Solodar section, while the Ukrainian defenders mostly stood their ground in the other two sections. The Ukrainians would be threatened by operational encirclement of Seversk only in the case of the Russian advance on all three supply lines leading to Seversk. Assuming that Russia has secured all its targets until this point, Russia may take the MO3 highway to advance directly on Slovyansk the presumed end target of the Russian Donbass offensive. But that would mean advancing on a narrow axis for more than 40 kilometers, which would require a monumental breakdown of the Ukrainian defenses in Donbass. Moreover, they would have to secure their flanks to prevent the danger of being cut from their supply lines. This would also necessitate a simultaneous movement on Kramitorsk, presumably from Konstantinovka on the H-20 highway. This would mean a Russian advance of more than 30 kilometers. Again, this looks highly unlikely given the pace of the Russian advances in this war. Just as a reminder, the Battle of Bakhmut started in August 2022, and Russia has not captured the city as of February 13th. An important factor which may hinder the Russian advance on this axis is the elevation between Slovyansk and Krasnohora. This is a natural advantage for the defending side, since it gives better vision of the Russian movement to the Ukrainians. A similar elevation has so far allowed the Ukrainians to defeat waves of attacks on Volodar. In any case, Matviev believes that the Russian army is incapable of going any further than Slovyansk and Kramatorsk, and they would have to siege these cities for months if they even reached them. Then, Matviev rightly notes that the success of the Russian advance on Slovyansk and Kramatorsk will also depend on the Russian offensive on the North Lahansk front from Kremina on Liman through Zarichna and Yampil. This would secure the right flank of the Donetsk group and support them from the northern bank of the Seversky Donetsk River. Michael Kaufman identifies another possible axis of advance for Russia on this front towards Kupyansk, allowing the Russians to create a bridgehead on the western bank of the Oskil. Ian Matviev argues that Russia may also launch secondary attacks on the Zaporizhia front. One of the options is advancing from Marienka on Kurakova, which would cut one of the supply lines to Volodar. Coupled with ongoing attacks on Volodar, 
The Russians may force the Ukrainian defenders to withdraw from Volodar if Russia also succeeds in taking Velika Novosilka and cutting the T0509 highway leading to Volodar. Matviev speculates that Russia may launch a faint attack from Orykiv along the Kakova reservoir, but adds that achieving success on this axis would be challenging. According to Matviev, the final auxiliary attack of the Russian army may be in the Avdivka section. The Russian army has been launching frontal assaults on this town for months, without success. The ultimate target of this attack may be Pokrovsk, another critical highway junction in Donbass. Matviev argues that the overall target of the expected or the ongoing Russian offensive may be to reach the Velika Novosilka pokrovsk kramatorsk sloviansk line and then possibly advance on Izium if everything goes swimmingly. Almost nothing has gone according to Russian plans in this war, so achieving this significant progress looks unlikely at this point. But the Russian army has some momentum now, and may be able to sell the aforementioned potential advance as a victory to the local public. Matviev notes that the Ukrainians will attack Russian supply lines and weapon depots, which would help remove its most crucial component, artillery support. He indicates that Russia may bring its reserves and military assets closer to the front to mitigate its well-documented logistical ineptitude. This would make them more vulnerable to Ukrainian strikes. The second tactic that the Ukrainian army may use is to prolong battles. This is already what they were doing in Bakhmut. They are losing men and equipment, but winning time for Ukraine, which still needs several months to get pledged tanks and other weapons from the West. Matviev rightly indicates that a quick withdrawal will not help the Ukrainian army preserve its forces, since they would leave well-prepared strongholds for weaker defensive positions and would be chased by the advancing Russians. Kaufman also argues that the Ukrainian army would be wise to absorb the Russian attack and exhaust its offensive potential to be in a better position once they are ready to launch their own offensive. According to Matviev, Ukraine may also launch surprise counterattacks during the Russian offensive to threaten poorly defended flanks of the Russian army. For instance, Ukraine may choose to attack the right flank of the Russian army towards Svatova and Starobilsk, forcing the Russians to extend their lines. The author argues that even a small success of the Ukrainian army in such a counterattack may force the Russian advance to stop. The Russian leadership wants to avoid any land losses for political reasons after debacles in Kherson and Kharkiv Oblast and may overcommit units to prevent this from happening. Matviev concludes his thread by saying that 2023 will be decisive in this war. We will see Russian offensives, Ukrainian counterattacks, and possibly a Russian switch to a wartime economy. Notably, battles are ongoing on almost all axes mentioned by Ian Matviev, so one can argue that the long telegraphed Russian offensive has already started. The battles in and around Bakhmut, Marienka, and Avdivka started months ago. At the same time, the Russians have recently launched an offensive from the Kremina section, along with activating in Zaporizhia Oblast towards Volodar and Orykiv. According to Kaufman, the offensive has in practice begun weeks ago, remains focused on the Donbass, and is likely to be underwhelming relative to some of the pronouncements out there. The Ukrainian National Security and Defense Council Secretary Alexei Danilov agrees that Russia has already launched its planned offensive, but it's falling short of their expectations. The Russians have been attempting unsuccessful frontal assaults on Volodar, which have bled out its elite naval infantry. They have been fiercely attacking in the Kremina section for days too, but have failed to achieve a notable breakthrough. But their main focus has been Bakhmut, which Matviev and Kaufman rightly emphasized as the primary axis of advance of the Russian army. So far, the Russians are gaining ground around Bakhmut, and very soon, we will see if the Russian army is capable of further progress there. We will discuss the unprovoked and illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine in upcoming videos, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.